One of the biggest industries in New Zealand is dairy farming. New Zealand produces around 3% of the world's milk and is around the 8th largest producer globally. Despite producing all this milk, New Zealand cheese is very boring, mostly made up of rectangular blocks of cheese like this. So what happened in our history of cheese making to make our cheese so dull? Hey there cheese historians, I'm Julia and this is Cheese History, a channel all about the origins, history and impact of cheese. In a previous video I looked at the beginnings of cheese history in my own country, New Zealand. Now New Zealand doesn't have an expansive history of cheese making. Cows, sheep and goats have only been here for just over 200 years, so cheese has been made here for at most just over 200 years. And for most of that time, cheeses like cheddar have made up the majority of cheese produced. So in this video, I want to try and explain why that is. Today, there are four main cheeses that dominate the mass-produced block-style cheeses that make up the majority of cheese sold in supermarkets here. They are Edam, Colby, Mild, and Tasty. Now, even if you aren't from New Zealand, you may be familiar with the Dutch cheese called Edam and the American cheese called Colby, both of which I do plan to cover in future episodes on this channel. You may not have heard of Mild and Tasty. Both are types of cheddar, Mild is just a young, mild cheddar, and Tasty is a hard, aged cheddar. It took me ages to figure this out, even though it's usually written on the packet, so it's entirely possible that many other New Zealanders don't know that Mild and Tasty are actually both types of cheddar. Usually they come in one kilogram blocks, which is about 2.2 pounds. As a matter of interest, I would love to know whether you buy cheese as rectangular blocks, or in triangular segments cut off a wheel, or in any other way. So let me know how you buy your cheese in the comments. I'm going to start by looking at the rise of cheese factories in the late 19th century, which was the first step to making cheese on a large scale. The invention of refrigeration happened more or less at the same time and opened up export markets around the world, leading to growth in the dairy industry. It is against this background that I will be able to explain the dominance of cheddar in New Zealand. One of the first key steps to understanding the dominance of cheddar here is the development of the industrial cheese making industry, beginning with the early cooperative cheese factories. Cows were brought to New Zealand from neighbouring Australia by Christian missionaries in 1814. I go into more detail about that in a previous video on the early cheese history of New Zealand. If you haven't seen it, it's worth checking out to get the context for this video. From the initial five cows and a bull, who were followed by many other new arrivals, small herds began to spread with European settlers all over the country. Some of these immigrants brought small plots of bush-covered land that they then set about clearing and cultivating to support their families. Most of the time they were subsistence living, but some began to sell any surplus goods they had, particularly cheese and butter, to local stores. Some of these products were also exported to Australia, forcing the quality of the cheese and butter to improve in order to survive the three-week journey in an unrefrigerated ship. This market led to some of these farmers turning to dairy farming as their main way of making a living. One way to make the process of producing butter and cheese more efficient was for small groups of farmers to form cooperatives. The farmers would be able to combine their resources and create a small factory to process their milk into either cheese or butter. New Zealand's first dairy cooperative was the Otago Peninsula Cheese Factory Company at the Springfield Homestead, formed in 1871 with eight local dairy farmers producing four tons of cheese that year. It was set up by Scotsman John Matheson, who immigrated to New Zealand in 1858 with his wife Catherine. Not long after they arrived, they settled at Vauxhall on the Otago Peninsula. John bought 20 cows and Catherine set about making milk, butter and cheese, which she sold to the town folks in Dunedin. In 1864, the family moved to Pukehiki, high on the peninsula, and the cheese and butter making continued apace. While it was John who was the business brains behind the new cooperative, it was Catherine who provided the practical know-how. Her reaction when her husband came home to tell her that he'd assured his new business partners that his wife would heat the way from the factory in their own kitchen is not recorded. However, Catherine did teach the factory's manager to make cheese, and soon after gave up the laborious work that had consumed her days since their arrival in Otago. The Edendale factory in Invercargill claims the accolade as the first purpose-built cheese factory, beginning production in January 1882. The Ashburton cheese and butter factory started producing a little later that same year. 
These early cheese factories were small affairs, receiving milk from nearby dairy farms once or twice a day depending on the season, and producing small quantities of cheese for local consumption. From the 1880s onwards, dairy factories started popping up all over the country. Wherever there were dairy farms, there were dairy factories. The dairy farmers who put their money into cooperative dairy factories had to make a decision on whether to go for butter or cheese. Over much of the early period, cheese paid slightly more than butter, but whey was not as valuable as skim milk for raising calves and pigs, which were important. In addition, cheese factory suppliers, farmers, had to cart milk to the factory instead of the considerably smaller quantity of cream supplied to butter factories, which became possible when home separation was introduced. So the dilemma facing many early dairy farmers who were part of a cooperative was should they be producing cheese and the less valuable whey, or butter and the more valuable skim milk? It seems that at least the Otago Peninsula Cheese Factory Company went with cheese, while the Ashburton Cheese and Butter Factory decided to avoid any decision at all and do both. Even if the factory did both, the farmers would still have to decide whether to take cream for butter or milk for cheese to the factory. For others, like the Edendale factory, it's much more difficult to tell which way the factories and the cooperatives went, as they don't include any keywords like butter or cheese in their name. The arrival of refrigeration around 1882 was the driving factor in the rise of many cheese-making factories in the 1880s. These factories included the Geraldine Cooperative Dairy Company in 1884, which is today New Zealand's oldest surviving factory. Refrigeration not only made long-distance transport possible, but also opened up new parts of the country for cheesemaking, such as Northland, Waikato, and Taranaki. This meant that the farmers, who up to this point relied on producing a range of products to make a living, could now specialise in dairy farming, because refrigerated transports could take their butter and cheese all over the world if needed. The first refrigerated shipment sailed for London in February 1882 on the Dunedin, carrying butter from the Edendale factory. In 1883, William Boren wrote a pamphlet outlining the case for exporting cheese to Britain to meet the rising demand for cheese there. He suggested creating medium-sized factories, receiving milk from the local farms twice daily to produce 8 to 10 tonnes of cheese per month. The cheese from several factories could then be shipped together in refrigerated containers to Britain. The byproduct, whey, could be fed to pigs, creating a secondary market of dairy-fed pork. Basically, milk goes into the factory and cheese and pork comes out. A cheese factory matching this model was the one built in Ashburton in 1882, able to process 12,000 gallons of milk. Another was built by Danish-born Hans Madsen Ries in Dunivirk in 1892. Ries was a Lutheran minister and only turned to dairy farming after he lost everything, including his church, in a fire in 1888. He returned to the church in 1895. But he couldn't leave the dairy industry alone completely, opening H.M. Rees and Sons to sell livestock, vehicles and farm tools to the settlers on newly established dairy farms. As an Anglican minister was responsible for the first cows arriving in New Zealand, it seems like the dairy industry and the church could never quite get away from each other. So many dairy factories and dairy farms could exist because there was an export market for cheese from New Zealand. So how did that export market shape the cheese made? Dairy production rose dramatically in the later decades of the 19th century as the export market increased. The number of dairy plants rose from 36 in 1885 to 247 in 1900. Very few of these small and medium-sized factories remain today as the development of much larger factories and the ability to transport milk long distances put most out of business by the mid-20th century. The export market to Britain came to dominate the New Zealand cheese market. This was partially driven by the rise of industrialization, with factory-produced cheddar, initially from America, flooding the British market with cheap cheddar, leading to a decline in cheese production throughout much of Britain. This decline meant countries like New Zealand could begin using industrial processes to produce and export cheese to Britain as well. At one point in the mid-1920s, New Zealand and Canada were the main sources of cheese for England, with imported cheese accounting for 75% of all cheese consumed there. As Britain was the main export market, the main cheese made for that export market was cheddar, as that was what the British wanted. Two world wars also helped solidify New Zealand's place as one of the main cheese suppliers for Britain. During the First World War, Britain couldn't rely on imports of dairy products from the Netherlands, France and Denmark. It was agreed that New Zealand would supply a third of its cheese output for a fixed price, as well as a smaller portion of our butter output. 
As the war dragged on, the government requisitioned the country's entire surplus of butter and cheese in 1916 so as to supply the British market. This gave Kiwi producers a guaranteed market for their butter and cheese, providing a financial security they had not previously had. While the war ended in 1918, the dairy sales agreement remained in place until 1921 as Britain rebuilt its shattered economy. A similar agreement was made at the start of the Second World War. However, by 1943, butter consumption in New Zealand had to be rationed in order to keep up the supply to the UK. The rationing stayed in force until 1950, and the agreement to supply Britain with dairy products lasted until 1954. When Britain joined the European Economic Community in 1973, New Zealand was initially allowed to continue to supply them with dairy products until 1977. This prompted a move to diversify the export markets to include more exports to Australia, as well as new markets in the Middle East and Russia. Today, cheese is not the main dairy product exported from New Zealand. Instead, milk powder exported to China makes up the largest segment of dairy exports. The export markets to Britain partially explains why New Zealand has historically made so much cheddar. You do have to make a product that your export market actually wants, otherwise they tend not to buy it. But that doesn't really explain why cheddar also dominated the local cheese market. I mean, today our main dairy export is milk powder, but milk powder doesn't dominate our local market. So why was cheddar the most popular cheese for local consumption as well? To go some way towards explaining the preference for cheddar in New Zealand, we have to start with cheese making in England. English cheese making was dominated by cow's milk cheeses since before the 14th century, as cows thrived on the flatter lands, particularly in southern England. Cow's milk became the main source of milk for cheese making in New Zealand for a couple of reasons. Despite being a rather mountainous country, New Zealand also has flatter plain regions, like the Canterbury Plains in the South Island and the Waikato region in the North. Both are ideal for dairy farming. While people from all over the world settled in New Zealand, many of the first waves of settlers after 1840 were from the various parts of the United Kingdom, where cow's milk cheese already dominated. So it's not too surprising that cheeses common in Britain were also common in New Zealand. The main cheese produced in New Zealand, both for export and the local market, was cheddar. This was partially because it was a fairly hardy cheese that did well on the long journey from New Zealand to Britain. The other reason is that cheddar was a familiar cheese to the British settlers, who were already having to adapt to a country with different plants, birds, climate and customs compared to their homeland. If cheese could be a point of consistency with their former lives, then that was what they wanted. It's also worth noting that they also imported many of the plants, birds and their customs to New Zealand from Britain, making something of a little England in the Pacific, and forever changing the New Zealand flora and fauna. They couldn't import the British climate though, something we are very thankful for. During the mid to late 19th century, in the early years of European settlement after New Zealand was incorporated into the British Empire, by and large, cheese was considered a poor person's food. Back in Britain, it was more affordable as a protein source than meat, so was eaten in greater quantities by people with low incomes. Of course, the wealthy had access to a whole range of luxury cheeses, many imported from Europe, like Brie and Roquefort, but for the working class people, cheeses like cheddar were what they could afford. By contrast, in New Zealand the settlers had an abundance of meat, particularly fish, pork and mutton, meaning that they had the luxury of looking down on cheese as a second-rate foodstuff. This view meant that much of the rise of factory-produced cheese in the late 19th century was due to the export market, usually back to Britain, rather than local consumption. The roots of New Zealand's strong presence in the dairy export market, a key feature of the economy today, and the limited range of cheeses available until recently goes back to the nation's early history, when migrants from Britain were doing well enough to look down on cheese as a second-rate foodstuff. Over time, that changed, and people ate more and more cheese, but it didn't seem to have much impact on the types of cheeses eaten. This is because the tastes of New Zealanders for cheese were very conservative. There are records of attempts to introduce other styles of cheese, such as the Swiss cheeses Gruyere and Emmental, in 1885 at a factory in Pukirimu near Cambridge. This attempt failed after a year. The Edendale factory made Stilton in the early 1910s, but it didn't sell well. Then, in 1912, the then Department of Agriculture appointed a Miss G. Ness Davies as an instructor in the making of French regional cheese. 
From 1912 to 1921, she travelled the country teaching the art of making small fresh cheeses, not only to factory cheesemakers, but also to a number of small-scale farmhouse makers, many of them women. It was Davies who made New Zealand's first camembert, Columier, Gervais and Pont l'Evêque. Despite an optimistic outlook at the time, an innate conservatism in the consumer meant that the market for these soft and fancy cheeses proved to be limited, and only one or two small cheesemakers persisted with them. Cheddar is not the only cheese made in New Zealand today though, so this caution towards anything different had to end sometime. But it would not be until the 1950s that the varieties of cheese began to seriously increase. When the New Zealand cooperative Rennet Company in Taranaki began pilot production of new cheeses, the range expanded. Blue Vein was first in 1951, and was followed by Gruyere and Danbo in 1960, Feta in 1961, Romano in 1964, Parmesan in 1965, Gouda in 1966, and Edam in 1976. From the 70s onwards, it became easier to travel to and from New Zealand. We are, after all, a long way from anywhere in the South Pacific, with Australia as our nearest neighbour. To get anywhere quickly, you really do need to fly. On their travels, Kiwis got to experience the cheeses of the world, and immigrants to New Zealand from Europe wanted cheeses that weren't cheddar. Dutch cheesemakers arrived and started making Gouda, Edam and Leiden. French cheeses like Brie and Camembert also grew in popularity. Around the 1980s, there was a rise in the number of artisan cheesemakers, and this rise has continued, proving that high-quality cheese is more than just a passing fad. In recent years, thanks to the rise of artisan cheesemakers, there are a lot more options for cheese in New Zealand. One small cheese company in the South Island called Whitestone Cheese even discovered a local New Zealand strain of Penicillium Rogue 40, the mould used to make blue cheeses. They use it to make a distinctive New Zealand blue cheese called Shenley Station Blue, named after the farm where the mould was discovered in a bale of animal feed. So why did cheddar dominate for so long? Well, the rise of dairy farming led to the creation of dairy cooperatives and small-scale factories throughout the country. These, in turn, led to larger industrial-scale factories to supply the export market of Britain after the demise of its own cheesemaking industry, largely thanks to the development of industrial cheese production. The export market relationship between the two countries was strengthened by supply agreements throughout both world wars. Cheddar was the cheese the British wanted, so cheddar was the cheese New Zealand supplied. The conservative and British-dominated taste of New Zealanders for cheddar meant that very few other cheeses could make much of a dent in the local market, until the 1950s, when other cheeses began to be more widely accepted. I would say that cheddar still dominates, but that its hold on the New Zealand cheese market is steadily decreasing. I am hopeful that, even though for most of its history New Zealand cheesemaking has been dominated by cheeses like cheddar, that the increasing popularity of other cheeses will see more diversity in the types of cheeses made and eaten here. You never know, maybe one day New Zealand will be exporting its fancy cheeses to the rest of the world to compete with the great cheeses of the world on quality rather than just quantity. Thanks for watching Cheese Historians, it's been fun to delve into the cheese history of my own country. There is much more I could say about New Zealand's cheese history, so there may be more videos in the future. If you want to keep following along and learning about anything related to cheese history, feel free to subscribe to the channel and hit the like button if you haven't already. I hope you have a spectacular day, because every day with cheese is a great day.